I've been thinking about ambivalence lately. Um, not the wishy-washy sort of meh sort of ambivalence, but I'm thinking about a much older meaning of the word, one that's closer to its origins in the words amba, meaning both, and valer, meaning strong. And this sense of the word gets at the ability to hold two things strongly and simultaneously. I'm interested in how art can help us hold ambivalence. Let me give you an example of an ambivalent piece of art. An unknown artist made this reliquary around the turn of the 15th century. This angel pieta is a conventional image type that the artist's contemporaries would have been familiar with. Setting the scene in this way, the artist set his viewers up to think that this angel pieta was like all others, in which an angel holds the dead body of Christ. But look at Christ's eyes. They're half open. So the artist is sending us two simultaneous and strong messages that Christ is both dead and alive. Here's another thing that makes this object entirely unique. The artist carved Christ's body from mother of pearl, an exotic material that was a marvel of its time. I wish that we could see a video of this object and experience its iridescence, how it continually oscillates between a multitude of colors. We can't. Um, it was stolen from a museum in 1991. But let's, for a moment, pretend that we are 15th century Christians and that we are beholding this bizarre scene in which Christ is at once living and dead, and that this dead and alive figure flickers and shimmers multiple colors all at once. This is a profoundly ambivalent object. And it speaks to the profound ambivalence at the core of the Christian mysteries, that Christ was at once God and man, that he died and rose from the dead. I learned about this object and these ideas from a wonderful article written by the art historian Beata Frick. Talking with Frick about this reliquary gave me a new perspective on the art that I make some six centuries later. So it got me thinking about what are the unfathomable, mind-contorting mysteries of our time? Just last month, the Nobel Prize in Physics was given to two scientists who were able to get atoms and photons to exhibit superposition of states. This means they were able to get them to exist in two places at the same time. How are we to comprehend such a thing? Maybe the answer is through art. The art I make serves as a bridge between the nanoscopic and visible worlds. My images and objects allow us to enter into the ambivalent nature of light when it interacts with these nanoscopic particles that I make. I make these particles in the Alavisados lab at UC Berkeley, where I'm an artist in residence. Here's some examples of some artwork that I make using silver nanoparticles. As you move around these pieces, you witness their optical ambivalence. You see how their color is dynamic. It changes with their light environment and where you stand in relation to them as a viewer. They transmit yellow light and they reflect blue light, and often both at once. The artwork's also ambivalent in the sense that it's both art and science. In this piece that was commissioned by the Leonardo Museum, the aspect ratio of the microscope slide hints that you're looking at something that originated in a laboratory. The scientific community recognizes that my art speaks to the mysterious nature of light itself. Here, the same museum commission was featured on the cover of Nature. It, it ran in conjunction with an article by two Stanford physicists who study particles like the ones I make. Normally, when scientists study nanoparticles like this, they think about waves of light interacting with these particles. But in this instance, the author suggests that it's useful to think about um, light not as waves, but as discrete packets of light, photons. 
And this gets at one of the central mysteries of our time. How is it that light can be both particle and wave? Light is ambivalent. Here's another mystery that confounds me. In my lab, I synthesize silver nanoprisms. I make these nanoparticles in water. Um, first, I synthesize these spheres of silver that look yellow by eye. And when I expose these little spheres to particular wavelengths of light, particular colors of light, they actually change shape from spheres to triangles. And when they change shape, they change color from yellow to turquoise. So we have a case of color causing a shape change, which in turn causes a color change. Weird stuff. <laughs> so these pieces are visually ambivalent as well. Um, this is a sculpture that I made with the silver nanoprisms. Um, and I gave it this elongated, exaggerated shape to emphasize their strange optical properties. So when you look at this piece head on, it looks sort of blue-green. And when you look at it from the side, it's muddy brown. So this sort of color is called structural color. It, it's color that results from how something's made rather than what something's made of. So in this case, I can control color by controlling the shape, size, and packing density of these tiny nanoparticles smaller than wavelengths of light. So here's another ambivalence. Nanoscience is considered a very young field. The technologies it's produced are novel and cutting edge, which is why I love to tell people that nano craftsmanship is several centuries old. This is the 13th century cathedral of Saint-Chapelle. Its windows, the colored glasses, are filled with gold, silver, and cobalt nanoparticles. At sunset, when the angle of the light changes in the sky, the windows change from being blue to red. So we associate this oval shape you see here with mirrors, and I make I made this piece using a 19th century technique for making mirrors out of silver. And this whole series of work speaks to the fact that the processes that the Victorians developed for making silver mirrors and silver photographs are strikingly similar to the ways in which contemporary chemists make silver nanoparticles. So there are little glimmers, little hints of blue and green in these pieces, and that suggests that there are nano architectures present even in this work that I made using, you know, 19th century technology. We can't experience light directly. We can only sense how it plays upon surfaces. It's at the boundaries where one system meets another that light changes path. And it's this change of path that we see. Without a surface to redirect light's trajectory, it just travels on unimpeded and undetected. I craft surfaces to catch, scatter, bend, and transmit light in ways that allow us to experience its ambi ambivalent nature. Standing in the presence of something that is at once two contradictory things encourages us, us to suspend the desire to try to reconcile those things. I believe that art is uniquely suited to helping us develop the capacity to hold multiple contradictory things, and in this way, initiates us into the mysteries of our time. Thank you.